So joining us on the first episode of uh, the Taylor Bassett Scale is Justin from Do Not Scratch Your Eyes. Hello, Justin. How are you doing? Good evening, Peter. I'm very good. You okay? I'm very good indeed. I'm very good. Uh, we are going to be talking about just the one man, Mr. Ray Lewington, uh, who you will remember. So just before we start and go have a, have a little look about Ray, what are your memories of, 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 of Ray Lewington when he was in charge? Uh, we said earlier on he followed on from Viali and money was short, but what were your memories of him? Well, my memories of Ray Lewington himself are that he was a very um, personable person. He was, always seemed to be very cheerful, very positive. Um, I think he was ousted in a particularly unpleasant way, if I remember mm -hmm. rightly. I think it was his time was brought down um, quite suddenly, if I remember rightly. Um, my memories of the football at the time aren't all that positive, but that would probably be because of the constraints he had financially. Um, but of Ray himself, I I was a fan of Ray as a person, definitely. Okay. So if you look at the bottom there, we have Graham Taylor at one end, uh, number 10, 10 out of 10. And at the far end, we have a small icon representing Dave Bassett. I avoided any devil signals or symbols or anything like that. <laughs> um yeah. uh, that that being one so just initially if you were to to give us a kind of a a number of the emoji icon that you remember as uh, as ray what number would it be roughly well i think it would be a 5 to be honest because it is it's um he he did neither a good nor a bad job. Probably a good time to bring up his stats, to be honest with you. His three seasons. Um, he didn't complete that final one where we turned to the championship. He was let go a little bit, but we thought we'd just put the whole season up and kind of have a look and see how things went. So his first season kind of finished 13th um, and he got through to that semi-final of the FA Cup. We'll have a look at that in a little while. But there was some really interesting stuff, I thought, which was when he was actually recruited in and we mentioned the money problems. And uh, th this interview, which came through from Watford Legends at watfordlegends.com which is a fantastic site and if you want to read the full interview please do go there and he was interviewing him about how he taken over what happened he said you know when I got the job I was told of the circumstances though I don't think I was told 100% and he was aware that a wage bill of 14 million pounds had to be reduced to 3 million in three years so it took a massive financial reduction for him to take over uh, he said he went into it with his eyes open but yeah he suffice to say it was worse than it was actually kind of described and one of the things that happened on Ray's watch was the players actually ended up taking a deferral of wages which was uh, you know really something to see and Neil Cox the the captain who you interviewed only only a couple of weeks ago I think yeah. only a few weeks ago they yep. all the players took a deferral of 12 percent wages which um cox's captain negotiated went in with the support of ray so he got a, a real issue with his players straight away that you know kind of money's money's tight extremely tight mm. um and it, and it's really something but the thing was even though he had that the the <laughs> literally for, for me quite amazing thing was he finished his first season in 13th viali with an increased wage in the in the, the year previously finished 14th the first one that we had was the was, was the fa cup in his literally in his first year and we we had a, a an away win at macclesfield tommy smith getting a goal at sunderland before he later joined sunderland there was a game at home the quarter final we went one nil up and then probably the the, the moment of the cup run was this it's glass Fantastic goal, Watford are in the semi-finals. There's no way back for Burnley now. Stephen Glass, who's scored only his second goal of the season. A man who's actually appeared in an FA Cup final. Sends Watford that one step closer to the semis. It was an unstoppable free kick. And there we go. He took us through to a semi-final. Bless him. Um, mm. That semi-final didn't quite turn out as we obviously would wanted. But um, what were your memories of that? Did you did you get along to the game? So my memories of that day are obviously going to uh, Villa Park, being right at the back of the whole end. 
like right at the very very back and it's quite a view from there by the way yeah um long way down um the game itself i don't really remember very much about to be honest was it marcus gal who scored our goal it was he got a he got a late consolation and uh Oh, I think this is Ormerod, isn't it? Right to Ardley. Glass. Oh, he set the crossbar. Ormerod. Still Ormerod. BT arriving. It's gone in. He's bonded it over the line. Southampton. They still talk about 1976 when they won the FA Cup. Marcus I didn't Gale. realise that went down as a Robinson own goal as well, their second goal for Southampton. That that seems to have gone down as a Robinson own goal. So, yeah, no, I mean, yeah. you know, another day we might have got more out of that game. I think there was expectation we were going to do better than that, to be honest. OK, so we're going to have a quick look at a, a, a new feature. Uh, a new feature. It's the first show. Every feature's new. What the hell am I talking about? Um, we're going to have a look at our memories of, of, the, of the, the, the managers that we're going to look on the Taylor Bassett scale about the good, the bad and the ugly. So during uh, a Ray's tenure, who was good? Who was bad and who was ugly? I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one here that I think definitely during during Ray's time, Heide Helgerson. And not just because his wife was stunning, uh, but because in the box he was he was just so determined to get his head on absolutely everything and anything. Uh, Ray spoke about him and and said that what he needed was just to slow down a little bit because he was always running everywhere at hundred percent and trying to control the ball in that particular instance. Then you know once he's done that, it's kind of you know really hard to do. I think he'd said that you know. Pele couldn't couldn't do that if he was going at 100 miles an hour like uh, like good old Heidi used to. But what a level of determination and somebody who, uh, you know, as we record this, our last game was a 3-0 defeat to Norwich and the lack of <sighs> determination from the players was really something. If we'd have had some Heider kind of uh, kind of determination, it would have been something. I can't disagree with that. I think he was one of our shining lights for a few seasons, Heider Helgerson. I think he was... Um... He's definitely a, a bit of a club legend, to be honest. Um, it's a shame that uh, more people that can only sort of reference Troy Deeney, some of the younger people, don't remember him playing. I also think Neil Cox. And I mean, you know, I, I heard the interview from you guys the other day and he's quite modest about his involvement in the uh, in, in the deferral that the, that the players took that season. Um, you know, but he actually went in there and made sure that effectively uh, the club was going to stay out of administration. Um, and there's a lot of onus of doing that. And when you when you're trained as a professional footballer, doesn't necessarily mean you've got the greatest people skills in the world. But he really did go in and uh, uh, and do a lot. One of the things that he referenced on that particular uh, uh, interview, I remember, was one of the games that really stood out was after they'd gone and spoken to uh, uh, to the team and got everybody to agree to take a 12% deferral, they went away to Sheffield United and uh, and basically had to try and see what, what they could do about, you know, potentially getting some points. The game there, coming forward in numbers, Alisson! Great start for United. They're really sprinting through. And this time he's gone all the way through. And that's a penalty. Helgerson went down. And Jack Yelka goes off. Chris Foy says penalty. Fox. Right the way across, Helgerson. 2-1. Well taken, goal two. Low cross, near post. There you go, Cox gets the penalty. Hyder gets up in the air. It's almost like I actually put that together deliberately. Uh, it is, isn't it? Very, uh, very close. <laughs> as you know, that, that, that's that's not a level of, of, uh, of professionalism that I have in me. That's more luck than judgment. <laughs> <laughs> who, who else do you remember around the uh, the, the right time? But other players who kind of uh, you know kind of did it for us. 
Neil Ardley. The bad and the ugly. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Neil Ardley always seemed to be running up the wing and whipping balls in. Um, so that's a name I remember from that period. There was also another Icelandic guy called Brynjar Gunnarsson uh, in the midfield who I remember being a fairly handy player as well. Um, obviously, Robbo would have been around at that point, would he not? Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep, Robbo would absolutely. have been around. So, um, I think in terms of the bad, for me, it was ITV Sport. I mean, it was £3 million per year taken out of the club coffers. And as you saw there, you know, earlier on, having to reduce that wage bill down from £14 million down to three was a, a, an incredible task to do. And the fact that, you know, Ray kept us in the division for that amount of time was really quite something. Uh, but my ugly could only be one person. And he's not ugly necessarily in the conventional sense of the word, more very, very fierce and frightening. But I definitely think we have to include Sean Dyche as in, in the ugly camp, even if it's just the football that he plays at Burnley. What are your memories of uh, 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 of the uh, <laughs> of the ginger stopper? Uh, and I'm not just talking that. about Carl. <laughs> <laughs> um, solid defender, absolutely. The SD on his chest there, solid defender. I thought he was great. Yeah, I, and he I, I, he looked like he was going to be one of these central defenders that would pick up cards and things because he, as a player, he had a very uh, no-nonsense way about him, which obviously he's carried into um, management as well. Um, but Dyche, I always thought, was great. He was a super player, and he he, he featured you know pretty strongly in uh, you know in, in coming into some 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 really good games. Talking about uh, another game, first of all from the first season, and we uh, we we had a game against Coventry that I remember, which was great, and we played some really great football here. Let's have a look at this. Need to set the stall out early, Nielsen. This is Weber and Glass. Right foot. And the man who got two at Highfield Road last year gets the first one here. Great pass by Weber. Glass with the right foot into the bottom corner. Glass. Smith. Coventry at the moment with very little to go on. By way of possession and relying on Hildegard's save. Gale. That's great. Smith. How close was that? Lovely ball by Gale. Smith. Now Weber. The challenge was missed by Walsh. And Weber still goes. Smith for the return. This could be a great goal. Wonderful stuff. A case of I've started, so I'll finish. Weber back in. Smith looks up. Hildegard advances. Smith wins that battle. on every time Watford come forward Coventry press the panic button Weber that's wonderful and that is finishing straight out of the top draw Smith for Glass look at this piece of skill and a wonderful finish Robinson on the overlap opportunity knocks didn't come for Weber Nielsen it was only delayed and Nielsen made it four going in for Weber Hyde Robinson Smith Robinson It's five. Again, a well-taken goal. 
God bless Mike Vince, it's five. I like that. That's the kind of minimalist commentary that I enjoy. So much that I made it minimalist by not showing the commentary goals, which I just think was something I could provide for you. Um, if this isn't the most blindingly <laughs> obvious excuse to show Watford wins and Watford goals, I don't know what is. I'm not trying hard enough. Um, well. Some of the memories there. Bring him back. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, for a start, Danny Weber. How could I have forgotten Danny Weber? He was a great player. Um, and Alan Nielsen, who I actually included in my top five players of all time when me and Carl discussed it ages ago. So how I could have forgotten Alan Nielsen as well, I don't know. But um, yeah, some great goals there as well. So um, Ray did a, did a great job right, maintaining the status quo, keeping us in the division. That was what he was charged with, bringing that budget down from £14 million of a player wage bill down to three. Um, so really kind of sustaining us in terms of status whilst having, you know, kind of literally one of the lowest budgets in the championship at the time. Uh, but he did a good mm. job there. But in that final season, before he got the sack, which we'll talk about in a minute, he also took us on another cup run uh this time in the league cup um uh, always a glamour tie to go away to cambridge united and feral <laughs> scored i don't remember feral do you remember feral scoring i remember Ferrell. He, has, he has gone into the <laughs> the, 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 the bowels of time um uh, reading away oh, there he is. Uh, Reading away was a 3-0 win with Boatza, Cox and own goal. That's not somebody called Og, um, unlike <laughs> Farrell. We got, we got a penalties uh, result against uh, Sheffield United, which was, which was excellent. Um, and then we had, uh, and this was two days after my son was born, so I wasn't at this particular game. I was in the maternity ward in Watford General, so I could hear everybody having a damn good time. So thanks, everybody. <laughs> um against Southampton but I'm not bitter so um in about uh, well certainly this week we will be releasing the big match of the day from that 5-2 victory I may have let out what the final score was but I don't think it was a secret so we'll be having that I think you had a similar problem with the next round didn't you Justin I did yes because my daughter was born on the 27th of November so I missed the Portsmouth home game uh, I did go to the Southampton game and it was a very, very good game. My memories of that are mainly the Stuart Wrigley thing uh, where he was about to lose his job and the Southampton fans were singing, can we come and sit with you, which was wonderful. It was a, it was a very good night of football, actually. I really enjoyed that game. I'd still remember it, yeah. And of course, we had the semi-final two legs uh, away at Liverpool. Um, uh, mm -hmm. ki kindly, the record seemed to call it a Steven Gerrard goal, um, as opposed to a Neil Cox own goal. We already referenced that interview, but he, he came out with and, and pointed out the reason why he didn't play pretty well that night, if you recall. I do. He said on the interview that um, he got poked in the eye by, uh, is it Didi Haman? I think it was. Is that his name? Um, it, yeah. The yeah, guy. it was Didi. Yeah. He's saying he couldn't see properly or something because he had a bit of a bit of a dodgy eye where he got poked <laughs> in the eye. That was his excuse. Anyway. <laughs> he said he was blind for the whole time. So let's just have well. a quick look at a uh, just a before before we finish here um, to a, a kind of a typical Ray Lewington side. I picked the side from that Southampton game that's going to be on the big match of the day there. But some names that we remember. Um, in terms of, we, we mentioned Tommy Smith had moved on um, and Ray bought Bruce Dyer back. Bruce Dyer, who performed so well back in 94 alongside Paul Furlong, uh, came back and played a different kind of role. He was much, uh, much older, more experienced by him uh, and not quite so rapid. And he didn't play down the down the wing as much. Uh, but you mentioned mm. Neil Ardley. What were your memories of Neil Ardley? Funny enough, running up the wing are my memories of Neil Ardley. I just remember him flying up the wing and sort of knocking balls across. Um, but but looking at that team, I mean, Jermaine Darlington, there's a name I'd, I'd forgotten. Um, sadly, I, I don't remember him as being a bad player. I just forgot his name. Gavin Mann, was he brought in by Viali and, and had worked with Lewington at Brentford or something? I'm trying to think I, of the connection of I think of he was Mann. brought in by Lewington. I think he was brought in by Lewington because exactly because of the Brentford connection uh, where he'd been right. the captain, where he'd had a fine head of hair, despite the evidence yes. in this photograph. And for the majority of his time, Bob. he <laughs> looked like Sideshow <laughs> Bob when he was at uh, when he was at Brentford. And he, 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 yeah. he, he decided he was having none of that nonsense once he came to a decent club like Watford, which I'm glad to see. 
I think the nice thing here is that we have Sean Dyche at his happiest in this particular photograph. Uh, that that <laughs> that that's him. That's him content. I think that's the important thing to say. Is that wow, blimey! And of course, Doily uh, Lloydinho in that team as well. Um, who who you know? Correct me if I'm wrong. Was playing in the game against Leicester in the 2013. Oh. Playoff semi final, wasn't he? I think oh. so. Oh, he's... I mean, he, he, he was he was man of the match for that game for me. I mean, he was the one player in defense who just took kind of basically took no prisoners and didn't give a penalty away because otherwise you could include Cassetti. Um, no, he yes. he was <laughs> he, he turned up at Wembley and looked like he was born for it, which is which is odd because Lloydinho always used to seemingly get dropped by every manager who would come in and just have mm. this keep plugging away consistency and play his way back mm. into contention. Wonderful. Yeah. Really, you know, what, what a yeah, character. Loved him. Absolutely yeah, loved yeah. him to pieces. In his third season, after the the, the League Cup semi-finals concluded, uh, we, we were we were dallying with, with potential relegation and the club decided with about six games to go, if I recall, to, to let him go. And they brought in A.D. Boothroyd, um, which, you know, and I think most fans feel that Ray was dealt with quite harshly, bearing in mind what he'd done. He was incredibly popular with the fans. What was your memories of that? Exactly what you just said. I think he, I think I remember uh, thinking, you know, because he was he was let go with no real warning. I just remember there being a, a report, you know, Ray Lewington's uh, been sacked, and it, it goes back a little bit into what you just said there. Ray Lewington in his third season. Wow, a manager in a third season at Watford. <laughs> Well, these days wow you know um and i'll tell you a story actually peter that when our season ticket renewals came after that i actually sent mine back because i didn't want to go because i thought i can't see how this no mark manager who no one's ever heard of can do any better than ray lewington's done over the past three years you know Two or three months after that, I was busy trying to buy tickets for games because all of a sudden, wow, Watford are playing really well and we're going on a bit of a run. And I was eating huge amounts of humble pie and A.D. Boothroyd is still one of my favourite managers of all time. So, um, but yeah, like you say, no warning that Ray Lewington was going to be dismissed, I don't think. It was all very, very sudden. Um, Again, yeah. if you if you go to the Watford Legends interview and have a look at that, there he mentions about the fact that he was more or less given a almost like a restraining order from you know he was told not to return to the Vicarage Road, not to contact any of the players, not to go to the training ground, uh, which which seemed odd because he'd done such a sterling job and he never mm. has ever threatened to be anything other than taught well of Watford to the point that in the middle of making this, which which seemed which is going to seem like it had a, a level of planning, which it simply doesn't deserve. Uh, Ray Lewington <laughs> has returned to the club with Roy Hodgson. Um, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hanging out to say they'll both be around for three seasons this time. That's for certain, no. but a no. massive welcome back. And hopefully some of you guys can see that from this Ray can take, or can certainly contribute to taking not an awful lot in terms of resource, quite a long way. Having started, uh, the, the show and you you placed your memory of Ray at number five so that make that puts him there at the orange flat lined faced emoji or, or right. non, non smiling emoji we've gone through we've covered off how he kind of dealt with the debt we've covered off how how he's not been treated well uh, by, by the club on his departure his two cup runs dealing with uh, you know the the post uh, Viali era which was really difficult which basically meant he had to bring the, the the wage bill down from 14 million down to three and it was worse than that uh that was what mm. he was told and it was it was worse still because of course itv digital went pop as well where do you think you would put him at the conclusion of this well having gone through what we've gone through um and you know you have to factor in the fact that he took us to a league cup semi-final um that hasn't happened since um he took us to an fa cup semi-final that has happened a couple of times mm -hmm. since then uh, and of course we've been to a final as well but you know he did that on a very very small budget um so taking everything into consideration um i did five previously i'm i'm gonna put him up to four now i think um yeah i think four 
because I think history has been a little bit unkind to Ray Lewington. A lot of the football at that time, to my mind, does seem very, you know, not very stand out. It's, it's very murky, old fashioned, dig your heels in football. We've been very sport with some of the football we've had since then. Some of it's been fantastic mm, recently. Absolutely. Not. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give him, I'm going to put him up to, to, to four on the scale. So he's one step closer to uh, Graham Taylor and one step further away from Dave Bassett. That seems reasonable. That's where I'd want to be. Certainly closer to Taylor than Blassett. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. the, the next show we're going to be looking at um, Gianfranco Zola, the first of the Pozzo incumbents. And your your colleague, uh, Carl, will be coming on to talk about that. He's going to have to decide wherever he puts him, whether or not he's going to go above or below Ray Lewington. Uh, on the Taylor Bassett scale. So we will see. Thereafter, we will have many others coming in, hopefully. But if you at home are watching this, uh, one, really, you need to get out more. But secondly, um, if you want to come on, if you've got some good memories or bad memories of a particular manager and you think you might want to sit where Justin's sitting now, Justin won't like it because that's his home. But other than that, <laughs> if you want to sit there and explain to us why uh, you know, a, a manager was good, bad or indifferent and you've got a preference, just reach out to us, let us know, put a note in the comments. And also, if you've got memories of Ray Lewington or you just want to welcome him back now, he's back. Do pop them in the comments. Do let us know. Um, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you again on another Taylor Bassett scale. Thank you. <laughs>